Science versus non-duality. Ooh, that was the feel I got. Yes, and we're talking about how scientists, you know, don't know anything about consciousness, right? And they can't explain things in, you know, asking a lot of hard questions. Scientists can't explain this. But, you know, they just wave their hands like this. Whereas what the real explanation is, we wave our hands like this, and then we say, it is the mind. <laughs> and that's no, it's, that's like saying, I don't know also. So we're in this state of we... We are developing, you know, relatively primitive models of how this all works, including how the world works. And, and uh, I, I, I'm glad to see that uh, there's been such a lot of uh, exciting uh, scientific aspects of the conference, too, because we're obviously all here because we share the sense of uh, the oneness, you know, that the uh, commonality, the non-duality part. It, it, the question is, and what the conference is about is the relation. It's called science and non-duality. Um, what's the idea? What is the relationship? Is it? And I've always liked that because it's a matter of saying, you know, it's it's inclusive. It's both. We're saying how do they relate then? Because that's a question. And how can the two work together? And how can science help the uh, increased um, awareness of non-duality, for example, um, develop consciousness in this way? But um, there there are so many different views and. Uh, one of the interesting points that, uh, uh, as I heard the discussion on the first night, I was hearing people talk about the idea that awareness and consciousness were the same thing, basically. And I said, hmm, well, that is not at all what uh, the patron saint of this particular conference would say. Right? And Nisargadatta, you know, Maharaji says, uh, when asked about his dreams, you know, what, what are your dreams like? So, well, you know, I sleep and I have dreams. What are they like? They're like uh, echoes of the daytime, something like that. Well, what about your you know, deep sleep? And you say, well, yeah, uh, I am an unconscious and something else. And, well, what, what do you mean and something else? Well, I am aware of unconsciousness. <laughs> you must be using these words in different ways. Of course, because... Consciousness is awareness plus mind and the structure of the individual brain. You see, and that's, that's a critical understanding. So consciousness is, does have to do with the brain, uh, but it's not awareness. Awareness is, uh, the, is the word for what it is prior to the one thing we are sure of, the one thing we know. is not the contents of our consciousness. We don't know that those are real. Right? We, that's exactly what we don't know. We know we're having an experience, whatever it is, yes, but we don't know anything about the nature of the contents of experience. That is not given. What is given is I am, or something even prior to that, just there is whatever I don't have to put words. But that's not consciousness. Consciousness, the word is con, it's with knowledge. What kind of knowledge? The, this guy, or the, you know, the two kinds of knowledge of, of, of you know, Kennen and Wissen in, in German, that the, the, the knowledge of by acquaintance, the knowledge by being, and the knowledge of scientific abstraction, uh, knowledge about. And, and uh, they're not the same, right? And, and so consciousness is, is a combination of those, right? It's got that, that knowledge by being, which is the awareness component that gives it its subjectivity. Right? That part that seems to be impossible to figure out how it could come out of matter or arrangements of, uh, you know, of functional systems, that must have to do with you know, the way things are. And there's nothing you can do about it. So. Well, uh, the, uh, just to, to contrast the kind of approach one can make to the uh, states of consciousness in the dream state. In the dream state, it's easy enough to say, ah, I realize I'm dreaming. Now I can signal 
mark the time and record when it occurred by making an eye movement signal, looking at a certain pattern that will show up in my sleeping brain. No problem, because I've got a dream body. There's something I can do that will make a difference. But suppose we're in a state where we don't have a body. But remove the body. So not only don't you have a body, but you don't have directions then. There's nothing, you know, there's no forward, up, down, because those are all relative to your frame of references, which is your body. And uh, so this occurred in the very first lucid dream I had in the laboratory. It was a, a, a one in a thousand or more lucid dream. I never had one like that. It was totally uncharacteristic. And it started out where I said, oh, I must be asleep. Why? Because I can't feel anything. I'm in the, in the black void. It's darkness. There's nothing here. There's no body. I don't have a body. I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. No sensations at all. But I knew here I am. And so I then, you know, I was thinking obviously because I think about the state, but it had no uh, contents other than thought. Let's say when I'm thinking about, wow, what's this? I'm asleep. But that's all I knew. And general, uh, gradually it then developed into uh, some imagery floated around and then suddenly I found myself embodied and then made a signal, which is what I was trying to do. But the problem is, so if you have no means of making a signal, there's nothing you can do actually. I mean, you could say, well, maybe you could change your breathing, but that implies an awareness of breathing. You have to in order to change your pattern of respiration, you need to have an image of respiration so to breathe in a different way. So I'm not sure you can do that even. So there may be no action you can take while in the state. But if it's true that uh, when you wake up from it, you can report on, yes, I was in that state or not in that state, or don't remember having, but I do remember having been in that state. We can then study the difference in the physiology of those conditions when people after the fact reported in that deep sleep or whatever, whenever it was. It's not quite as good as the tight uh, time coupling you can get with lucid dreaming, but it is a way you could study it. And uh, uh, there have been studies in the past on the topic, but they haven't really gotten to that degree of sophistication. But I can see it easily coming now because there's a great deal of new knowledge about delta sleep. And uh, I believe that, for example, that there are methods of intensifying REM sleep. Actually, the, the thing that uh, Deepak and Rudy were talking about sounds like sort of that idea, but there's actually ways that really work. Uh, that by stimulating uh, in phase with the delta waves, you can intensify them, make a deeper delta sleep. And then it's possible that uh, at the peaks of those delta waves, you get more of the the activity of the brain that can sustain awareness or a consciousness, I should say, so that you can be conscious, you know, of the absent contents. But I love the way, you know, it was uh, put though, by the, the, the I am uh, aware of being unconscious, which say there are no contents. And consciousness is about contents. It's about something happening. Uh, I'm with it. I'm sharing it. It's an interaction somehow. One of the uh, methods of dream yoga is that, that once you realize you're dreaming and you're in a dream, then you meditate, so would you withdraw your, your attention from the dream and uh, uh, various techniques, but one, you can shut your eyes, for example, and, and uh, what happens next? And sometimes you stay asleep than in a state that is more like this emptiness. Now, the, the, the case that I described, the, the first one in the lab, it, it, uh, it was interesting and unusual, but it didn't have any, anything special uh, about it, as far as I was concerned. It didn't have a, a, a character of it, it's not a pure, yeah, it didn't have any properties. But it, didn't, it was an interesting nothingness. Whereas in other cases, for example, when I was pursuing a particular project of seeing what I can do with lucid dreaming in terms of understanding uh, my truest nature. Uh, I had experiences that were very much like that, which I could describe. And uh, it, it it's, uh, really started out with the uh, concept that uh, I first I had to go through a level of uh, personal integration of, of, of accepting any kind of uh, nightmarish shadow figure that 
I came across. So if there was somebody that uh, I wanted to get away from in my dream, uh, I had to go back and befriend them or accept them in some way rather than you know, avoid them and transcend, you know, fly away because that was just an avoidance idea. So I had to well, first work on the level of accepting what happened there. And if you don't do that, you have a problem that, uh, that Frederick van Aden, who uh, coined the term lucid dreaming back in 1910 or so, described having a series of lucid dreams in which sometimes you'd have these wonderful beatific dreams where he'd be floating in the clouds, feeling uh, blissful uh, uh, transcendence and angelic music, you know, the usual kind of thing, heavenly. Uh, but then he said, but I'd have these other dreams that would follow it frequently where I'd be followed around by devils who would be mocking my pretended holiness and my reaction to them, of course. Then, so I get a whip and get away from me, you damned beings. And just think about that. So what he's doing uh, is he's t taking these angels and by his negativity turning them into a piece of himself that he is disowning, which is exactly why they are mocking his pretended wholeness, right? Because he's not wholly whole, because he's not accepting all of, of reality somehow, especially that part of his humanity that he's disowned. And so the, he seemed to be stuck on that because his conclusion from those demonic dreams was that this is what first showed me that, that not everything that's in our dreams comes from our own minds. These were uh, astral entities of a lower moral order somehow. See, it's, 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 a, it's a very destructive idea that the kind of astral projection notion that these, these entities out there, they're trying to get you and you've got to get rid of them, protect yourself from them. No, it's you want to transform the demons into angels. They're, they're messengers as they were of wholeness. And if you accept them, they transform. And so you give them power when you say, someone I gotta get rid of. It's, it's like, it's the craziness of waking up from a nightmare when you realize it's a dream. Say, so, oh, it's just a dream. So let me just get out of here by waking up. Well, why, if it's just a dream, do you have to get out of here? That's sort of disowning the process. It's not trusting the lucidity. As I showed a slide in the lecture about uh, one of these Gary Larson cartoons where uh, we, we, we see a dormitory, uh, you know, with flames and a fiery cavern. And uh, one guy says the next one, go back to sleep, Chuck. You're just having a nightmare. Of course, we are still in hell. Right. And that's what it is to wake up from the dream, you know, to try to get away from some part uh, by waking up. You're just not seeing it, but it's still within you somehow. So to deal with it while you're there is the possibility is that lucid dreaming offers. It says that's the time to connect and accept. And that when you do that, then that transformation occurs. So it's facing the shadow figures. And the shadow figures in the Jungian terminology is the idea that they're parts of our person personality that we've disowned because they were not rewarded by our parents, for example, and we were punished for certain behavior, so it was adapted to pretend not to be that way. Oh, it's somebody else that has, that did it, that I'm not, reward me. So we get a personality, that persona, an appearance that includes the good stuff and not the bad stuff. So we get this parts of our being that we've cut ourselves off from, the rest of humanity. So the idea of inclusion, of reintegration, of bringing it all together into a unity, you know, a non-dualistic oneness, that's a possibility of lucid dreaming. It's a very direct way. And that, that was what my own personal path with lucid dreaming has been. And over the years, uh, worked through those uh, and went from having frequent nightmares where I was getting away from the police, the underworld, the angry mob, you know, them, undesirables of all sorts. And finally, you know, learned to accept whatever it was that came along as it may be an unpleasant appearance, but I still need to accept it like that hideous giant insect in the other Gary Larson cartoon I showed on the doorstep, you know, uh, maybe it's a hideous giant insect in need of help, right? And so it could be 
of course, uh, Franz Kafka's uh, Gregor Samsa, you know, who has turned into the insect, and nobody uh, can see him from other than a horrible monster. Well, the horrible monsters need love too. And so that, that sense of, of a kind of a spiritual element in lucid dream is one of the possibilities I think that's very uh, available to uh, anyone that has lucid dreams. And it, it's um, dream yoga usually doesn't deal with that very much. And I think it's because dream yoga is an advanced practice in the Buddhist system that is already very strongly compassion based and and the ethical dimension and the acceptance of all sentient beings is something you're already doing. So they're not going to have to work through that level first. But if not, I'd say it's sort of a requirement. Once you've got that, then the next step is to say, all right, if in a lucid dream, I, as Stephen, suppose, will say, realizes he's dreaming right now. So what does that mean? If he's got only a little lucidity, he says, I'm dreaming. You're in my dream, for example, okay? Well, but that doesn't really make sense because if this is a dream, yes, you are a dream figure and this is a dream floor, dream Zaya, dream shirt, right? What else would it be? Dream arm, dream Stephen, dream body. This who I thought I was a moment ago has to be a dream, an idea, not who I am assuming that the I am is what I am. It, but this is not it. This is just a dream. So now I open up to what else is there? How can I experience in this dream something closer to my essential nature? And that then comes, you know, you got to open yourself to guidance, to the possibility to say, how can I experiences because you don't it's not something you make happen or do but it's an openness a letting happen and for me i had a very powerful experience that uh, is a sort of a roundabout answer to your question and uh, this came from uh, started out at a wake initiated lucid dream where you go directly into the dream state from the waking state and i found myself driving in a little sports car down a beautiful spring roadside and it's sort of like where i lived at the time they said it was a Stanford golf course, it seemed like, and it was a wonderful feeling of vivid presence and a beautiful day. And I see down by the side of the road in front of me an attractive hitchhiker. And, and I have the thought that, hmm, maybe I might stop and pick her up and that would be, no, that's a dream I've already had. I want this dream to be an expression of the highest potential, whatever that potential is. At which, that little bit of resignation, that renunciation, the car started to fly into the air. And as it flies upward into the clouds, the car has disappeared. I'm flying through the clouds where there are symbols of traditional religions. So Star of David and the steeple and cross on it and, and these different images of religion. And then I fly further. My body f falls away just as the vehicle of the car has gone now, but I'm a point of awareness going beyond the clouds and I enter into a vast emptiness, a space, a void that surprisingly is filled with love. It's homecoming, it's recognition that this is the source of being. It's here, always has been and I'd forgotten about it and I am overwhelmed with a blissful experience of, and I start singing songs of praise just in you know, Gaudate and uh, and that resonates with a uh, you know, vast space and just feels a perfect expression of what it is to be and I wake up from that dream and say, wow that seemed to be an answer to my request for a while, an experience of the highest potential but what did it mean because the, the the words I was saying up in that space there they didn't quite mean anything anymore because there wasn't an I. I was saying what amounts to I praise thee, O Lord, but there was no Lord, there was no I. There was praise perhaps, but there wasn't this duality. It was just this uh, oneness of being and return and remembrance and this homecoming feel. And from that experience when I then reflected on, on the meaning of it, so what, what did I learn from that? Because I never would have guessed that an empty space would feel that full. And this is a plenum. And uh, 
I, I realized that it was an answer to the, 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 the challenge that I was having of understanding how I could both be so apparently an individual and Stephen, distinct from Zion, you know, distinct from Nick, wherever he may be. And yet there's another being, right? This, this oneness. And, and it, it seemed that a, a metaphorical way of understanding that was here I was a, a particular snowflake and each snowflake, you know, is designed, you know, is different. It has a different crystalline form and every one is unique. So they say each one you look at is different from the others. So they're different. They really are different. They're not the same. But what happens to us at death? Here we are, a snowflake falling into the sea of death. And we say, ah, I'm going to be annihilated. I'm going to, my being is just going to be dissolved. That's it, the end. And once we hit the water, though, we experience an infinite expansion of being as we remember that we weren't just this one particular droplet of frozen water in that form we're identifying with, but water, the sea. And it, sudden, it just became plain, of course. It's in the metaphor, the substance of we that we share, and that's the one that that's there. The other thing, People can say it's an illusion, it's unreal. Sure, but it's got a biological reality and that's what we're most attuned to in these conditions of our life. So we, I think, shouldn't dismiss it and say it really is nothing, Go, it's just an illusion. Yes, it's, it's an illusion to think that that's all you are, is that you're only this form instead of your wider being that you've forgotten about. So, it's a relative point of saying, yeah, maybe it's better to think that the individual you think you are is nothing than to uh, forget the real being, the eternal being that we all share. So, so that was like the once I where when I went to that potential, it's the same kind of state that people report experiencing in the um, uh, well, the call it the aware, non-dreaming state. Well, the understanding stayed with me. The idea that death, okay, what's going to happen at death is Stephen, you know, and all his particular memories, his all his wonderful uniqueness that I'm so attached to, he's so attached to, this organism is attached to, yes, well, that is most likely going to simply vanish, except for in the effects I've had on other people and the works that I have created in some way that have passed on and continue in the, you know, greater thread of being of our involvement as humans. But what am I going, what's going to happen to the real me, the I, I'm going to continue to be what I was before. I was Stephen, of course, and always will be. What else could happen? So that seems hardly a tragedy. It seems like, well, now for what's next? What's of the infinite possibilities that are being presented? So it gives a change in attitude about what is death and what is the meaning of it. And I'm not saying that, that my organism has no, my, what I call me, has no uh, fear of death in that way. And of course, you know, I have attachments, I've got things I'm not done with, I'm not finished and all. But the concept of the annihilation of the individuality isn't frightening in the way it was when I thought, that's all I am. That will simply cease to be and that's it. Whereas I see that we all have immortality already. It's not something we can get. It's not something you know, we can avoid. It's what is. That's what it is to be I. I am. So it's, it, it changed my life attitude. But, and this is an example of a, what happened. A lucid dream was sort of deliberately chosen by, for example, the renunciation of saying, uh, rather than the, the uh, dream sex kind of scenario, which I've done before, that's not what I want. I want something else, something beyond. So that was a renunciation, I think, that was important to the dynamic, because the rest of what happened was not decided. It just occurred. It just happened. I just, it flew up. This just happened. And I found myself in this place as 
peeling away all the layers of the things that change that our biological organisms are designed to see. That's what we've evolved to see is the things that change. Those are the things that could kill us, not the things that stay the same. The things that always are and things that always have been are of course still here present right now, the source of being. Where else would it be? But we, it's exactly what we can't see with our biological eyes. Yet we can see them in a sense, with another sense of seeing, as the dream showed me. So the, it, it's, it's like there's a wonderful uh, little set, you know, about uh, when uh, at the beginning that all was dark and, and, and void and nothing was at all, and God said, let there be light. Now, well, so uh, there still was nothing, but you could see it better. <laughs> And that's what was happening. So I was being able to somehow see this nothing. It wasn't that uh, nothing that of conventional thought of the boring nothing, <laughs> but instead a very interesting nothing indeed, the nothing that is everything. So uh, the dreams of death can change people's view of, of how to live and, and provide a context. And, that, and this is one answer to the question of why can something that never changes make a difference to people? Right? Because if it doesn't change, what effect can? And the answer is it can change their context, their understanding of how to live and what matters and by their awareness of this thing that always is. And so that seems to change. Certainly our, our consciousness of the existence of the one thing that is does vary and that can change behavior. So that's the connection right there. We don't need lucidity for it. There are other ways of going about it. I mean, it's uh, when I was um, maybe 21, I had a, a non-lucid dream that was very powerful and relevant to, to death. And, and this was, I was um, crawling up, first of all, walking up a mountain road, and I'm, I started to feel lead in my legs. You know, this dream sometimes happens that you can barely move, and you can, Usually when you're running away from something that you can't really run, your feet seem to be paralyzed. And that sense of paralysis spread up my body. It's really like Socrates and the hemlock, and it was spreading up my body. And I had a sensation, suddenly the clear perspective. This is the end. I'm about to just die of this exhaustion, whatever it is, this paralysis. This is it, my very last moment. What am I going to do? And somehow the thought occurred to me, total acceptance. And I let out my last breath and a rainbow came out of my heart. That's what I woke up with. It, and it was simply the, I, the thought of acceptance at that moment. Was a, what can I do? I can embrace what is, which is the last expiration I've got. <laughs> there it goes. But embrace it. And that symbolically showed as a rainbow, which told me at that point uh, that death is not what we fear it to be. It was like that, you know, biblical sign after the flood idea, the image of, of a hopeful transformation that you may not have expected. But for that dream to have worked the way it did, I needed not to be lucid. Right? I needed not to know it was a dream because then I would say, oh yes, here I'm having a dream in which uh, my dream body is, thinks it's about to die. But no, I really believe I was about to die. This is it. What am I going to do? So there are ways, and it's a balance that, that there are cases where lucidity is extremely useful and cases where it's better not to know. And so uh, for my personal practice, uh, years ago I arrived at a simple formula, which is to say, I want to realize when I'm dreaming whenever it's wise. So I'll leave my unconscious mind to tell me here's a good opportunity to notice it's a dream and to do something different from what you're doing because it usually is sort of going wrong and making a mistake and then I'm running away from something, a chance to reorient, to, to get things right. So it's a, once you've got the skill and practiced enough that it's available when you need it, then that seems an appropriate use. I did have one, one observation about non-duality that I wanted to share. There's a, there's a, a simple little story, and, and this is, you know, a, a, a father, you know, says to his uh, double-visioned son, son, you see two when all is one. And he says, 
Gosh, how could that be? If so, I'd see four moons up in the sky instead of two. <laughs> and we, we, see, we just can't, you know, conceive of what this means. And so uh, the problem is, is uh, without distinction is no indication. You can't specify what you're talking about specifically without making a distinction. So I can say this bottle of water and you know, I mean well and not the hand and not all these other things and it's a clear the, the bottle of water in my hand and it's, it's a, a distinct distinction right and so you know what I'm indicating but I have to divide the world into two pieces to do that to the thing it is and the thing it isn't so now I want to indicate the one thing there is the, the totality the whole the all the one I can't point to it. I can't distinguish it because there's not a two. So that says I can't do other than speak nonsense. And that's why I said before, you know, I'm a metaphor, a little finger pointing beyond either or. That's, you can speak metaphorically and that's what all the talk that we could ever do about non-duality has to be because any specific otherwise is going to be wrong somewhere. It's like a map, uh, trying to make a map of the globe with a flat map of Earth, right? And some maps show what we need to know in San Jose and don't tell us what's going on in other parts. And so you need different local maps, but you can't have a single global map that is always right. So that calls for an openness. So.